so it's the early hours of the 6th of March 2024 UK time and it's Super Tuesday in the United States um, I've been watching a bit of the coverage on CNN and the BBC and uh, it's it's as predicted really Trump is sweeping up the Republican states and Biden sweeping up the Democrat states well not states but the um, their respective delegate counts um, not much to say on that. Uh, I don't see how Nikki Haley can really get a path at this point, and she'll have to convince her donors to stay in. Um, I've just watched a comedy film with Will Ferrell, uh, The Campaign, um, which is very funny. Um, but it shows the absurdity of American politics sometimes. But frankly, ours right now isn't much better. Um, it's only marginally better, I think. Um I won't say much about Super Tuesday and I haven't even uploaded a video on it because I think it's just, it's boring in the sense that it's predictable this year, but it's also depressing because I think America's got a terrible choice in 24, maybe the worst choice it's ever had. Um, if I was American, I'd definitely go for Biden, but, you know, it's it's not a great choice. I don't like how Biden's pandered to the woke left of his party. But I think Trump is toxic. So um, I want to focus rather on the future of this country. Now, I saw a little data that shows retention, fewer retentions, but three minutes. So if you're still watching this, um, what I would suggest with my videos, because I do make longer videos, so I don't do little five minute videos, um, multitask, go do washing up, uh, you know. Um, watch a photo slideshow or something while you're listening to me because I do think there are important issues to talk about so that's why I don't make my videos too short um, I wonder what direction this country is going in I, uh, I think it's fair to say I'm politically homeless right now I'm somewhat disillusioned um, but I, I don't say that I'm sitting on the fence because I'm someone who has strong views on things and I'm anything but apolitical. I think it's a mistake to assume that people who are not kind of partisan towards one party are not political. In my case, it's the exact opposite. I'm very political. And that's why I take it seriously. Um, now, I accept that you're never going to have a political party, even if you're a member of that party, or particularly if you're a member of that party, that you're going to wholeheartedly endorse every single position. Indeed, it's healthy for big parties to have internal debates. But as a voter, um, likewise, you're not going to have, or it's rare that you're going to have a party that you just agree with them on everything. Now, there are some people who are incredibly partisan, so there'll be people on the hard left who will, they, they hate the Tories so much that they will vote for any other party but the Tories. And likewise, you'll have people on the hard right who might vote for, well, they might vote for reform, but they'll do anything to stop Keir Starmer and the left getting back into power. I am not that partisan in the sense that, you know, I call myself a centrist. And I know a few times people have attacked me on this because they've they've seen a particular position I have and they'll say, oh, that's not a centrist position. But they're misunderstanding what this is about. Centrism is not one particular ideology. It's not taking a particular side on a particular cause. Centrism for me is just the median of all my positions. So, I have positions on the right, I have positions on the left, and when it kind of balances out, it comes to roughly the centre. But what it does not mean is that I don't have strong views. It doesn't mean that I'm just smack bang in the middle of every issue. There are some issues I would be a conservative, such as crime. There are issues that I would be well on the left. Um, so basically, I can't be pigeonholed in that sense. I'm somewhat proud of that. Because I feel sometimes, I mean, I was looking at the Prime Minister's speech recently on democracy, and I can't help but wonder, you know, of course a lot of people were cynical and they were attacking him. I can't help thinking, is that really because they don't like what he's saying? Or is it that they're just playing the old partisan game? He's a Conservative Prime Minister, so they have to attack him. Now, maybe if a Prime Minister Starmer was making the same speech, it would be the same thing. But I do wonder, you know, do people attack because they really believe it or they're just playing a game? Okay, I have to attack because he's 
is the opposite side rather than actually listening to what he said. I wonder because I heard a lot of people claiming that Sunak was stirring up anti-Muslim hatred, but if they bothered to listen to his speech, he was very clear that he also condemned anti-Muslim hatred. You know, he quoted women, Muslim women being harassed in the street. So that just says to me that those people were not paying attention to what he actually said. Um, so, you know, I, I'm in no rush to vote for any party. There's some things about the Tories I, I respect. I like that they've consistently been strong on Ukraine. I'm disillusioned by their weakness on China. You know, Sunak spoke tough during his leadership campaign. I think he's gone soft. Um, so I'm not happy about that. Uh, I also feel their stance on welfare I'm not happy with because this is the more left-wing side of me coming out now. You know, uh, Jeremy Hunt and Mel Stride, the Worker Pension Secretary and others, they'll talk about the need to be tough on the unemployed, to, you know, and I think they're pitching to the base there. They're pitching to Daily Mail readers and Sun readers. Um, but this is a big misconception. What Jeremy Hunt didn't say is actually there's already strict sanctions in place. And I have no doubt that the sanction culture at the DWP has directly led to um, serious mental health problems uh, among claimants, possibly even suicides. I don't think that's far-fetched. The Hunt, uh, you know, claimed that he was providing mental health support at the same time, but this is contradictory. You can't stigmatise people on one hand and then say, oh, but if you have mental health problems, we'll help you. It's, you know, it's the Tories' language on this that is the problem. I think they see welfare claimants as no different than criminals, really. Um, and, you know, they'll never admit that in the House of Commons, they will say, uh, oh, but we're trying to help people back into work. Um, anyone who's been through the DWP will know what it's like. Um, and I find it unfortunate a lot of people are still misinformed about this. They assume that claimants just get free money from the state. The reality is there are strict obligations in place. And more often than not, claimants get punished when they've done nothing wrong over administrative error. You know, so there'll be some computer glitch uh, that will state that they are meant to be at some meeting at 2 p.m. And they weren't told they naturally won't go to the meeting. It could be online or it could be in the job centre um, or on the phone. And then they're penalised for that. There is a sanction culture in place at the DWP. It's a pity there wasn't the same sort of threats levelled towards greedy energy companies, you know. Um, so this is where, you know, I'm not one to play class war or, you know, get go down that line. But you do have to wonder, are the Tories, well, where are their interests? Because it seems they want to attack people who are struggling whilst more often than not defending those who are powerful. It's, there's a fundamental rot there, and it's something I fundamentally dislike about the Conservative Party. Um, and I really hate this expression, you know, we're on the side of hardworking people. Um, Labour uses it as well, we're on the side of working families. The implication here is that if someone's unemployed, they're somehow, you know, not a citizen who has rights. They're somehow... You know, we don't care about you. The implication is that they're lazy and they're not giving anything back. Now, there's a lot of unemployed people working in the voluntary sector as they're trying to improve their CV. So if Labour does get in, this is one thing I would like to see a marked difference. I'd like to see less stigmatising language. I'd like to see a big reduction in the sanction culture in the DWP. I think it's far, far too easily handed out, sanctions that is. Um, of course, people who abuse the system should face consequences, but I think that the threat of sanctions is far too often applied. Um, and unemployed people, are, I think a lot of people are tired of being treated like they're criminals when they've done nothing wrong. You have someone, for example, who's legitimately sick, uh, so they're claiming, uh, or they're legitimately disabled, so they're claiming that um, particular benefit, and then they are, you know, told that they're fit to work by the DWP, even if they have medical paperwork to prove that, you know, it is what they say it is. Um, so I've got a big problem with that. And I've been through the system, so I speak from experience. But then I look at the Labour Party and, you know, 
it's one of those things. I'm not convinced Labour will be very different in that regard. I, I wish they would. But looking at Rachel Reeves' recent statements, her U-turn on banker bonuses, um, I do wonder, will they do anything to get into power? You know, um, there's a little bit of new Labour creeping through there, which, although, you know, Tony Blair, I consider a great statesman, it was one aspect of Blair's government I did not like, is they introduced the sort of toughening language on the unemployed and um, workfare, indeed, uh, this idea of sending people to businesses and companies to basically work for their benefit money, except anyone who looks into that will see that it's not a fair exchange, you know. They're expected to do um, to work like regular hours or near regular hours, but they're getting um, money from the DWP that is not the same as a wage. Now, people just need to know the facts on this because it's not what people think. Um, and I think, you know, the unemployed are an easy target. So I have a big problem with that. And it kind of disgusts me, actually, how disabled claimants are treated. Um, I think there is a sanction culture in the DWP. And frankly, I also think there's some very, there's many tyrants who work there who have a little bit of power. I'm talking about some of the advisors who, you know, they could just throw out sanctions when they feel like it. Um, that's also, you know, we've seen 14 years of Tory rule, rough sleeping is on the rise again. Um, that's, that's a Tory legacy. But then I look at the Labour Party and there's things I really dislike about them as well. I do loathe divisive woke politics. I do loathe the sort of identity politics that they pitch to. I mean, I think it's ironic to accuse the right of this. It's not the right that comes up with critical race theory. It's not the right that keeps talking about reparations. It's not the right that wants to, um, you know, shame our entire history um, and tear down statues and talk about white privilege and other such toxic divisive concepts. So it's pretty rich when I see left-wing pundits accuse the right of waging the culture wars. Um, I look at Keir Starmer's record. Um, I give him credit, you know, he is not Jeremy Corbyn. I give him credit for acting quickly on the anti-Semitism thing. At least initially, he was criticised over Rochdale, but he did act quickly when he became leader. Um, being leader of the opposition is one of the hardest jobs, I think, in politics. But Keir Starmer's record is he took the knee for Black Lives Matter, a very divisive movement. He shouldn't have done that. Um, there are Labour ideologues um, who would push critical race theory. Um, up to what level up in the party that goes? You know, Does Starmer approve of this? Does his inner circle approve of this? Um, I would be watching like a hawk if they introduce any legislation that is dressed up as tackling so-called hate crime, but may actually serve as de facto blasphemy laws. As an example, this recent controversy with Lee Anderson, um, you know, and I am solidly behind Mr. Anderson on that. Um, I'm disappointed, but not surprised that Keir Starmer and other figures on the left have, you know, jumped on the bandwagon. And then they've said, oh, this is the true face of the Tories, as if under some, some sort of awful racist. Now, again, it has to be reiterated. Lee Anderson was not talking about Muslims. He was talking about Islamist ideology. And frankly, even if he was talking about Muslims, which would be wrong and inflammatory, that's still not the same as a race. Um, so, you know, Starmer is not an idiot. Starmer would have known full well what he said, but he is choosing to play politics, jump on the bandwagon and say, oh, look, it's Islamophobic. Um, I have a big problem with that because, yes, it could be just politics, but I want to see a leader who is unafraid to use the words Islamist extremism. That's why I appreciate it that Rishi Sunak did. Will a Prime Minister Starmer do that? You know, um, because the left are very quick to call out far right extremism. Fine. But will they call out Islamist extremism? Jeremy Corbyn could never in his five years as Labour leader issue the words or utter the words Islamist extremism. Will Keir Starmer? So far, I haven't seen it. And I'd love to be corrected on that. Starmer will, of course, say he's prosecuted terrorists as head of the CPS. Um, that's fine. But language matters. 
the ideology of leaders matters as well as actions. Um, and I have a big problem with this weaponizing of the term Islamophobia. I agree with the Tories, anti-Muslim bigotry is more appropriate, because that refers specifically to bigotry against Muslims as people. The problem with Islamophobia as a term, it's a catch-all, right? So it's basically saying you cannot criticise Islam. We don't hear of Christian phobia, we don't hear of Hindu phobia, um, so why Islamophobia? I really would feel concerned that Labour might well bring in legislation that's dressed up as protecting Muslims that really is a de facto blasphemy law. That's something we need to watch very closely. Um, you know, Labour is probably going to win the general election, so these are the sort of questions I will ask before I vote for Labour. I actually want to have the motivation to vote Labour because it does feel like it's time for a change and I'm in no rush to vote for the Tories, but when it comes to foreign policy, I'm not too concerned there because there seems to be a united front on Ukraine, for example. Um, and definitely Starmer is much, much better than Jeremy Corbyn in that regard. As for someone like George Galloway, um, I don't think we should exaggerate his influence. Jacob Rees-Mogg said he's a maverick, so why is there so much attention on him? Although some would say he is as well. There's some truth in that. Uh, and it is true that in a democracy, sooner or later... Well, you have a system where if someone, you know, they have the finances and they have the support, they can stand. And sooner or later, you are going to get unpleasant characters like George Galloway. Um, I just hope that when he gets up in Parliament, you know, to grandstand, and no doubt he'll point fingers at the government over Israel and Gaza. I hope whichever government minister he is berating, I hope they fire straight back. If I was a government minister, I would say to George Galloway, I'm not going to take lectures from the Honourable Member for Rochdale when he has met bloodthirsty dictators like Saddam Hussein. I would throw that straight back in his face. Um, I think they should. I think one problem with the whole Galloway thing is people have been too, they've tolerated him too much as rivals. Frankly, um, too many other politicians have been too timid in standing up to Galloway. I think he needs to be exposed exactly for what he is. Um, I think he's rotten. Um, but that's that. I also don't think we should exaggerate his influence. I do not see a situation where there's going to be worker party candidates sweep across the board. Galloway happens to have a certain gravitas. You know, he knows how to stir things up. That's why he won the seat, among other reasons. But, you know, other candidates in the workers party are going to have that sort of um, oratory skill or, you know, influence. So that's one thing to consider. We shouldn't exaggerate his influence. Um, but I, I look at the direction in this country and I do feel concerned that uh, extremists are getting too much influence. And extremes take many forms. I mean, we've seen eco zealots in the form of just stop oil. We've seen extremes on the far left and the far right, it has to be said. I'm not blind to some of the things the far right come out with as well. I don't think the threat they pose is the same as Islamists, but... You know, they're out there. Um, but also, policing is a major, major issue here because policing is one of the things that we look at for a functioning democracy. And I think trust in the police is extremely low. I'm not going to say it's the lowest it's ever been. I, I don't know that as a fact, but it's certainly very low. And I think the police have to take some responsibility for this themselves because, you know, they might say, well... Resources are stretched because we're policing these Palestinian demos. Therefore, we can't turn up to burglaries. But how then do they explain that they seem to have the time to harass people over language? And how do they explain the lack of consistency whereby you could get pro-Palestinians putting a sectarian slogan on Big Ben from the river to the sea, yet... The second someone sees, you know, the second someone brings out a UK flag, the flag of this country, um, they swoop in there and move them away. Now, Tommy Robinson is not someone I would quickly defend. I don't much care for the guy. I think he's a glorified football hooligan. But you have to consider that the approach the police take to him is different than the approach they take to Islamists. And that's a problem. That is a problem. There is a lack of consistency. And the Metropolitan Police particularly have to answer to this. Why are they not consistent? 
And, you know, they can say it's a question of resources as to why they don't turn up to burglaries. Well, they seem to have the resources when it comes to harassing someone over the wrong language. That the police should have absolutely nothing to do with so-called non-crime hate incidents. So British Transport Police, don't they have something better to do than harass a musician? I'm talking about Brendan Kavanagh. Um, and basically serve as lackeys of Chinese nationalists. You know, don't they have actual crimes to be policing? Um, So-called police community support officers, when you have them harassing a gospel singer. I mean, there's so many examples of this happening. And of course, there's good officers who want to do the right thing, who do take real risks um, and apprehend dangerous criminals. I have nothing but respect um, for those officers. But I do think the police need to accept that there is a problem. And my message to good police officers is don't just complain. Acknowledge that there is a problem. It isn't just that there is a lack of the right priorities. It's also that there are, frankly, some rotten apples. It was recently reported that Wayne Cousins, um, the inquiry showed that he should never have been in the police. Well, surprise, surprise. But, you know, I do not think that Wayne Cousins is an isolated case. I do think there are some fairly rotten apples wearing uniforms. Um, when you get officers, for example, sharing tweets about rape victims, um, racist tweets, etc., th these people should not only be kicked out, they should be charged, I think. Um, it's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. So the public, you know, they're not asking for too much. The public want to see back the basics policing. That isn't too much to ask for. So I, I think the policing issue is a major, major issue. Um, I want to support good officers. I want to support officers who are tackling dangerous criminals. I will always support them. But I will not support officers who are abusing their power uh, to harass people who haven't committed any criminal offence. I mean, frankly, some police officers don't seem to know the law. And there seems to be a lack of common sense there. So what's going on in training? These are very important questions because if you get innocent people being held for hours when they've done nothing wrong, um, you know, and harassed, th these are very, very important issues. Uh, and I want to see politicians calling it out. One of the biggest domestic things we have is the justice system, and I've been very critical of that. And yes, I know it's different in England and Wales versus Scotland, but frankly, both systems are, um, there's very little public trust. Um, there was a case where a Kuwaiti migrant raped a girl. His sentence was 180 hours of community service. Uh, Samantha Smith posted this on uh, Twitter. That's the sort of decisions that infuriate the public. Why not a custodial sentence? That is available. So, you know, people will say judges' hands are tied. Not, I don't really buy that because judges have aggravating and mitigating factors. Why is it that they choose not to go for the maximum penalty available when the evidence indicates that should be the option? That should be the option that they're taking. I think that there are ideologically soft judges. Uh, they might say, well, we're not going to jail this person because of overcrowding. But really, when you have a crime as serious as rape, then overcrowding should be the secondary consideration. It shouldn't be the primary consideration. Um, I actually would favour building more prisons. I know that's controversial, and of course, like everything, it costs money. But the money, the cost from recidivism um, will be even higher. So I think the approach of the Scottish justice system, where they won't even consider anyone 25 and under to be criminally liable, I think that's abhorrent. Shame on the Scottish Sentencing Council. So all of these things, you know, it can be so easy to get depressed and disillusioned. Of course, it's not all bad. Um, we always have to consider the UK is, we're not a failed state. Um, generally, for the most part, our politics is peaceful. Tempers may rise, there are emotive issues out there, but we're, we are not in the sort of situation a country like Haiti is in. We're just not. And also analogies with totalitarian states like, like Russia and China are wrong. We can never be complacent about freedom, but such analogies are wrong. We do largely have a free press. Say what you want about the press, but they do cover these things. 
Um, it's not all bad, right? And one caveat is if you're looking at a political party and you really have a problem with some of their policies, unless you're hyper-partisan, you're going to find some issues that you agree on. I mean, I look at the Labour Party, I do not like the pandering to woke ideology, I do not like the politically correct um, hesitancy to talk about Islamist extremism, for example, but I look at Keir Starmer and I think at least he's not Jeremy Corbyn. At least he will be strong on international issues. I do think he will stand up to Russia, uh, hopefully China as well. Um, so it's not all bad. I mean, it's a better situation than when Jeremy Corbyn was leading the Labour Party. That's something. Um, but I am politically homeless. I'm going to think very carefully about my vote. You know, as for the Liberal Democrats, I've, I have very little uh, motivation by Ed Davey. I think he's... You know, he's incredibly politically correct. He jumped on the whole Islamophobia bandwagon against Lee Anderson. People were trying to compare Lee Anderson to George Galloway. That's obscene. One meets blood-drenched dictators like Saddam Hussein. The other calls out hateful ideology. I don't know how anyone can rationally say there's a comparison. Um, it's absurd. I don't know. Uh, obviously, the election is some way away yet, so... There'll be a lot more to say about this, but I'm just sharing my musings tonight. I do wonder what direction this country is heading in. I think we need to, I think too many areas were a soft touch. Yes, there's a small boat, so it's a major issue, but I'm also talking about, um, well, I was going to say Russian disinformation. Um, I think we have been quite tough on Russia, respective governments have taken a hard line on that. China, Sunak's gone soft. Uh, I want to see Keir Starmer unequivocally saying he's going to ban Confucius Institutes, not just stop funding, ban them. And I want to see Keir Starmer summoning the Chinese ambassador or his foreign secretary summoning the Chinese ambassador if they think they can play the wolf warrior thuggery in this country. Um, there's a lot of areas we need to look at with that. But I'm going to wrap this up now. Thanks for watching.